Alex Tate is currently play, uh, applying his trade at National Geographic Society in Washington, D.C. He works with mapping of boundaries and disputes, and he also provides consulting for impact programs and geographic education. Usually focused on the practical, today he's presenting on a deeper topic, looking at the process of map composition. Okay, thanks, Pat, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, as uh, some of you know from past presentations I've given, and as, as the introduction stated, I'm usually very focused on practical, on, on project-based uh, presentations about work I've done. Um, but uh, I'm doing something a little bit different um, this year, and uh, I actually had a little uh, push and help in uh, going in a slightly different direction. So there's this uh, work out there called the GIS and Technology Body of Knowledge. And this is a set of uh, materials, information, best practices, um, sort of knowledge about geographic information science, including cartography. And um, somebody uh, asked me to do uh, some work on this. Um, this is somebody that uh, has been with me for the last past six months because he asked me to do this in March with a May-ish deadline, and uh, I submitted my draft last month. So he's sort of been looking over my shoulder. Uh, this is Rob Roth at the University of Wisconsin uh, for a while, sort of just as he is right here. Um, this is a great, it's a great project. Um, this is free materials, open materials um, that people can use geared towards sort of entry level under undergraduates um, to provide information about various different topics. And so I was really pleased to be asked to, to, to cover a topic about map design. Um, I, now that I'm at a, at a nonprofit, I have a little more time for this sort of thing. Um, it did prove to be a lot more difficult than I realized to sort of summarize uh, what's been done, what's been written about, and as uh, Bill mentioned, uh, you know, visual hierarchy and layout and map design has been covered in a lot of way, a, a lot of places, but maybe not in full depth. Um, and uh, I'll, what I'd like to do as we talk about maps and map uh, uh, and the elements, the visual elements that make up a map, um, I'm going to share with you not the complete uh, body of knowledge I tried to put together, but just some highlights of things that I found interesting, things that for me after, you know, 20 years after being in school that I really enjoyed revisiting certain things and found some new things uh, that sort of came to me as I was working on it. So this is a map that I've been playing around with uh, on my own time of the Grand Teton. Um, you know, you have visual depth in this. Some things rise up, some things fade back. Of course, you have layout. Every graphic image has layout. So um, what are we talking about? How do we construct a map image? And uh, the body of knowledge tells me that uh, we have sort of a vertical way of distributing information in a map image. That's the visual hierarchy. So that's the way of ordering things in a, in a vertical way. And layout is more of looking at the horizontal. Um, and it's sometimes called map composition. I actually like the term map construction. It's you're taking the visual elements and putting, to, putting them together into a map. And what I realized as I did a lot of reading, I read a lot of textbooks, textbooks I hadn't looked at in a long time, textbooks that have come out since I was a, a graduate student and an undergraduate student. And, um, you know, there, this idea of map construction is really at the heart of map design. You have a lot of thought that goes before the map construction. You have worries about presentation and media and that after map construction, but at the heart, of making a map is the construction, the organization vertically and horizontally of the visual information. Um, many of you have probably seen something like this. Almost every cartographic textbook I looked like that included a section on map design or was about map design throws this out there for vertical visual hierarchy. And it always bugs me. It looks like a, like a, a computer monitor and keyboard gone mad, you know. Um, <laughs> Nobody ever makes a map to show that. So I decided, OK, I'm going to make a map for this diagram. So uh, I work a lot with uh, maritime boundaries, land boundaries. So I decided to just show, OK, these are the maritime zones uh, and limits for Cuba. 
and it would be my sample map. You're going to get sick of this by the time the presentation's over. Um, but I tried to pull out you know, what I thought was working in the visual hierarchy, the landmass of Cuba, the maritime zones at the top, the title, the insets, sort of as you go down, then the background, land and water, um, sort of building the visual hierarchy, and showing the layout. And it's really important as you're talking about these two concepts, they don't work in isolation, of course. So even before you get to visual hierarchy and layout, you, start, you have to think about the fields of what I call the fields of play for mapping. You have your map geography, which is the actual geographically constrained contents and data. And then you have the overall map image. And I sort of you know, built on this from uh, John Krieger and Dennis Wood get into this about the, 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 they don't call it, they don't use these exact terms, but they have a similar terminology for the map geography and the map image. Um, and then they come together in the final result. So it was great to uh, follow Bill on this, talking about contrast and gestalt. These are some of the tools for map composition. These are the way we, we organize or the, the way the human eye and brain organize visual information. But contrast is all about establishing differences in the visual field. Um, so there's stronger versus weaker, higher versus lower. It's how we organize the information. And then gestalt is a method to describe how, how does a re reader group these visual perceptions into broader structures. Sometimes it's groups, sometimes it's whole new interpretations. I think Bill called them object-based object or something like that. Um, two different ideas about gestalt. I'm not gonna go into, uh, as Bill said, I, he's not going into all of them, I'm not going into all of them. You can get these lists, it's gonna be in the body of knowledge. We're talking hue, saturation, value, a lot of the visual variables you're familiar with. Um, I've put an asterisk on a couple of these, like size, grouping, and detail, because there's actually disagreement among the cartographic texts over which one's stronger. So I'd like to, so when you have contrast, you're talking, I, and I, you know, so many of the cartographic texts use non-cartographic examples for things, which always bugs me. So I'm trying to have map examples everywhere I can. One of the problems, though, is it often starts mixing the different variables, and I understand why we go more abstract sometimes. So we have hue difference here that brings Cuba to the foreground. It's also a value difference. It's darker. A very slight hue difference from, for Cuba versus the other land areas. Now detail. I'm going to take a little poll here. These are the exact same hue, essentially the same size. One's very detailed, and one's very generalized. And the cartographic texts disagree. Some texts say that detail attracts more attention. Some say generalized attracts more attention. So those who think detail attracts more attention, raise your hand. Those that think the generalized shape more attention. All right. So there is a slight discrepancy. It looks like it's a majority on the detailed side, um, but that's interesting. So gestalt, let's get together. So this is all about groupings. Um, proximity causes grouping, similarity, direction. So straight back to my previous example, we have grouping by similarity, same, same uh, hue saturation value for Cuba. It's also proximity. So if we were working on Bahamas instead of Cuba, you wouldn't be able to use proximity. Those islands don't group together in the same way. So this is a great example of uh, gestalt. We have common direction. We have common fate. Uh, and as in most map examples, there's a mix. So there's also hue. So there's a lot of grouping going on here in this example. Uh, so interpretation or, or objects, um, this is where we get uh, you know, some of the classic, you know, almost tricks of the eye when you're looking at things coming together into new, new objects from, from multiple objects. But the one I want to focus on for mapping is figure ground. I think this is critical. It's, it's got to be part of the body of knowledge. Um, one thing I'd like to point out about figure ground in a map context, though, is just how many figures and grounds are going on at once. So you have Cuba and all its maritime and land areas as a, as a figure against the entire rest of the image. You have Cuba's land versus Cuba's water. You have the rest of the land versus the rest of the water. You have a lot of figure ground going on in one image. 
But of course, it is something you need to keep, keep in mind as you're working with both the map geography and with the entire map image. So finally, I'm at visual hierarchy. But I think it's important to look at the fields of play, the tools. Um, and then visual hierarchy really is a fairly straightforward process. You'll see, you'll see a, a, a concept. The idea is to match the visual hierarchy with the inte intellectual hierarchy for your map. So what's most important, what's least important. Um, and you'll see tables like this. Um, one of them I pulled from Dent. Uh, dense textbook, one I pulled from Ian Muhlenhaus's textbook, whether you're doing print or interactive, you, you get into the same process. So for my Cuba map, you know, the idea on the visual hierarchy is I wanted people to see Cuba first, Cuba and its zones. You just want to see them first right off the bat, sort of the next level down, I wanted people to, um, you know, have a title, know where Cuba is, and then you start working down through the other elements in the map image, the explanatory information on the bottom, a graph of the, uh, the area of the zones, the key explanatory notes, then some of the elements within the map, map geography, the notes about different types of boundaries, maritime boundaries, median lines, uh, and the like. And that should match, visually should match what your intellectual structure is for your, uh, hierarchy is for your, for your map. So, Gleaning some helpful, helpful hints on hierarchy from, from various texts. Uh, I like Cindy Brewer's from her design textbook. Just straight up, a map's purpose dictates which features are highest in the visual hierarchy. It's just, it's just a great concept to keep in mind as you're, as you're designing a map. I liked Ian's focus on color hue, saturation, color, hue, saturation, and value as the easiest means of manipulating contrast. I think Bill found that this is, uh, you know, especially value, Light, dark, really critical. Um, why, why take the most difficult route? If you're doing a quick, simple map, use these first to set up your visual hierarchy. Use a typeface with a wide range of visual weights. I haven't mentioned, type, mentioned typography yet. This is from Tom Patterson's excellent uh, uh, article in Cartographic Perspectives for students, students of all ages, I would say. Um, take a look at it if you haven't read it recently. Um, Typography is a critical part of building a map image, and I think it often gets short shrift in discussions of layout and design, and uh, integrating typography into your map construction is, is always important. Take advantage of hiding less important elements behind buttons, drawers, etc., in an interactive map context. So it's sort of like the miniature text at the, at the foot of a, of a print map that has the credit, the source, and other information. You can hide things. All right, layout, the horizontal. Um, this I pulled uh, the terminology from, from Ian Muhlenhaus's book, the idea of a compartmentalized layout versus a fluid layout. I think it's a useful dichotomy. Of course, it's more of a, a continuum, um, compartmentalized each, each uh, element of the map image in a different container. Um, and then fluid, more open. Some of the examples from National Geographic we saw yesterday that Riley and others showed. I think uh, are, are epitomize some of the fluid layout. But no matter how you're putting together your layout, and structure is important, you need an underlying grid that is aligning the different elements in the map. Um, the eye doesn't like chaos. The eye, even in a fluid layout where your eye is more free flowing, you need to have the stru underlying structure. One thing I noticed in the map example I did for the compartmentalized that really irritates me now is that I left this, this odd gap. So that's uh, borrowing a terminology from uh, John Krieger that's uh, about putting an unnecessarily, unnecessary extra sight line in my map. And the more sight lines you have crisscrossing your map, the, the less pleasing it's gonna be for somebody who's trying to read it. It seems minor, but you add too many of those and you start having problems. Um, a critical aspect of layout is balance and, and use of negative space. Balance gets like incredible coverage in almost every map design text. I think it's a very simple thing. You don't want it falling over one way or the other. You don't want it too top heavy or too bottom heavy. Pretty basic. Negative space uh, is really important. Cindy Brewer in her design book talks a lot about negative space. Um, actually, this is a map that I worked, at a, uh, worked on at International Mapping. 
Um, and uh, my colleague Jim Miller, who was there with me then, is actually sitting in the audience here. He did most of the work on this map. It's a great one. It was in the Sports Illustrated Atlas was, we got to work on. Um, but it's, I love the negative space on this. It's just really interesting. Uh, it, it's, it's its own character in this map. So some helpful tips. Use a construction grid to arrange your map elements. Whether you're going free flow or not, use it. Reduce the number of sight lines you have going on in your map. Don't fill all the corners and voids of your map image. It's sort of a basic dictum to, to map designers. Um, you want to have some negative space. And I added this one, eliminate unnecessary elements. People put things on their map that just don't need to be there. Uh, you know, the dic dictate, sometimes it's dictated that you have to have a north arrow on your map. If you have a graticule, graticule you don't need a north arrow. Um, Think about whether you really need those things, not just from a data perspective, but from a, a, a map image perspective. So uh, I like to call it the map construction four-step. You start with your intellectual hierarchy, your rough designs. That's like sort of conceiving your map and organizing everything really nicely ahead of time before you dive in. Then you have the layout and visual hierarchy of your map geography. The layout of the map geography is really projection, scale, and cropping. You don't have much else going on in a static image. In an interactive that's a slippy map, pan and zoom, you have a lot more going on. Um, you don't really even have layout for that, but you do have your visual hierarchy at every zoom scale. Then you lay out the elements of your map image and then you tie it all together and work back and forth between the map geography and the map elements that are not the map geography to get an effective image. Of course, Realistically, we, a lot of us skip this step, and we just launch right into doing the map geography. I do sometimes. So, some additional helpful hints. Don't overemphasize non-map elements. This is something you see in a lot of maps. Do, uh, do place your most important image t information towards the center of the image. Uh, this is from Tom. I think it's, it's, I think it's good practice. Don't, don't stick it off in the side. Uh, make sure that map typography is fully integrated into the construction process, not just throwing it on at the end. Avoid visual ambiguity. And this shows up in a lot of good map design textbooks. You want to make sure that your design is very, very intentional. If things are supposed to align, they better look like they align. If uh, something's supposed to be, have enough contrast to stand out, make sure it does. Uh, the last parting thought I have for you is squint. So when you're doing map design, especially when you're looking at visual hierarchy and layout, this is going to feel awful. Just <laughs> squint, and then you start seeing. You see Cuba and its maritime zones pop. They're right there. Thank you. <laughs>